So it's dead on three minutes past four and we said we would make a start. So I'm conscious that you're all giving up valuable time at the end of what I know will be a very busy working day. So um, welcome everybody and thank you very much for joining us. Um, my name is Erica McGuinness and I'm an improvement manager working for ESIS, the Emergency Care Improvement Support Team. As many of you will know, this session was organised in response to a very lively debate one evening last week on uh, the ED Best Practice WhatsApp group. And, and I think, you know, let it not be said that there isn't an intention and an interest to keep innovating at a time when there is significant pressure in our urgent and emergency care system. So that, that debate and that discussion was a question um, that colleagues asked in terms of where do you go when your system or your environment is so pressured that there is just nowhere else left to expand? And the conversation and the question was very specific to ambulance handover. Um, we have two colleagues today, uh, Laura, who I'll ask to introduce herself very shortly, and Ben, who are going to be sharing, I guess, what their respective organisations do. But this is an informal conversation and it's an opportunity for us to have a facilitated conversation and some headspace to get everybody's thoughts on what else might we be able to do. So without further ado, I'll just ask Ben and Laura to introduce themselves and then we'll hand over to Ben. Ben, do you want to start us off? Mute. Um, <laughs> hi, uh, hi there, Ben Owens, um, ED consultant at uh, Sherwood Forest Hospitals. I'm the divisional clinical chair. Um, I also clinical associate with ESIST um, and do a lot of work around risk and uh, urgent care flow, etc. Um, thanks very much, Ben, and thanks for taking the time to join us, Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Wilson. I'm the lead nurse at Salford Royal um, in Greater Manchester and um, I was one of the people involved in the healthy conversation on the WhatsApp group. Uh, so I'm here to share the work that we've been doing at Salford. Wonderful, thank you very much. We're going to try to split the conversation in half. So um, we'll let Ben go first and then we'll just give some space for questions and answers specific to, I guess, Ben's kind of narrative. And we'll do the same with Laura. And all being well, if we have time at the end, we'll expand that into a more general conversation. But it would also be really good at the end of the session to get your feedback on whether there is scope and, and an opportunity to, to have some more of these sessions. And we're, we're very happy to facilitate them if there are kind of topics of interest that colleagues are keen to explore a little bit further. Ben, I'll just hand over to you at this point. Oh, thank you. So um, I think so we've been on a fair state of trust. We've been on a bit of a journey. Um, we were one of the KO 14 trusts. Um, way back in 2014, 2013, um, our sort of CQC inadequate and that sort of thing. And we did a lot of work on that, soul searching on that, and did, looked at a number of things. And one of the things that always bugged me was people, the, the, the paramedics would come along and they'd queue, and they would queue in the corridor with the paramedics. And only when there was a nurse ready or happy to take the patient would we then, as such, would we then take the patient into handover. And, and the mentality was very much, they're not our patients yet because we've not taken them. Uh, so that we've not we've not owned them. And then well, a lot of conversations about this, and actually realizing that um, there are patients when they're on that, when, when, there are patients when they're on when they're in the ED, and actually the mental leap we've taken now is there are patients the second they call that ambulance. Um, just in the way I'd expect the medical wards to go, there are patients the second we refer them from ED into the hospital. We, as an ED, we can't have both ways. We can't say the ambulance patient aren't ours yet, but I want the wards to take the patient now. No, that's that's not that doesn't seem fair. Um, and uh, we used to have at one point years ago, we had a ratting area, um, which was one area, and what we found there was there was constraints because the second you had three, we had three space, four spaces when when four crews arrived, and the fifth one arrives, you got nowhere to go, so they waited. Um, and therefore, and we also noticed there's a lot of lack of continuity between you hand over to the sort of ratting nurse, assessment nurse, and then they move the patient on, and then the nurse looking after the patient doesn't take handover from the crew, didn't know things to hand over, um, and the junior doctors didn't go to that area either. So we had a lot of talk about this, a lot of debate, and we basically did two things. We did an ownership thing that they are our patients, the second they call the ambulance, they're our patients when they're in our building, we may as well take them. Um, if the patient, uh, there's a lot of debate, if the patient dies in the ambulance trolley, it's still our fault. They're in our building. One, the patients died and they'll, they'll be really unhappy relatives, but actually terrible for the patient, but actually really they're our patients. So we take responsibility, either the parent, um, and that was a bit of a thing. So I will just show you a slide. This is our ambulance thing, and this happened in a very short space of time. 
Um, and I'll just quickly share a slide, a couple of slides with you very briefly. briefly. Um, and um, this, is, this is our handover. This is good about 2015 through to um, April 22. And this is our, so we were, we were, we were sort of lower down the pack in East Midlands. And here we are. So th this is this is the EMAS handovers here. Um, and this is SFH, which is ours. Uh, this is so we we were, were we are lower percentage under 15 minutes then. Um, and we made a step change around April time, uh, March, April time, 2018. And it changed that we've been, that's where we've been ever since in the percentage of 15 minutes. This is our, this is our time. This is our over 30 minute time. And again, we were probably worse than the pack average. But the step change around the same time, we, we never more than an hour mainly, but we, uh, we dropped down there. And this is where we've been, we've gradually got better over time with that. And then the final one is there. That's kind of weird, but this is the, this is the over one hour ones, um, and you'll see here that we were never that high of an hour, and then we got to this point, same time frame, and we're there. Uh, and we see about a hundred. I'm going to unshare now. We see approximately 100 ambulances um, a day as an ED, um, and we I think we have our average time is 15 minutes. We have um, I think about five percent over 30 minutes, and I think we have our 3,000 a month. We have about five or six over an hour, so we really have. And that uh, you see the step change in that couple of months, and that was obviously pre the pressures we have now, but that was a mindset and process change, and we have sustained that time thing there. Uh, and the mindset change was simply there are patients we want them now, we want them, it's the priority that patient in the community is a high, is a high, if you're, the conversation, if your relative is one in the community lying on the floor with a broken hip with heart failure or whatever else, you want that happens now, now. And actually, um, so that's the first thing, a lot of conversation with staff about why it matters, why it's important. Um, the second thing was we did away with the rat area. Because the rat area is a constraint and ratting or statting, we're going to call it, or we call it, is a process, not a place. And therefore, we converted the four cubicles, which were our sort of assessment at cubicles, to just cubicles. And the, and the ambulance just came down to the main nurses station while stopping there. And actually, at that point, they just hand over to whichever nurse is next free. And the nurse, they come to support the nurses station. They, there's a receptionist to book them in there. The nurse in charge goes to see them. Someone shouts, the ambulance is here. We, uh, they'll allocate the nurse. The nurse will take the patient. Um, get, and whether there's a cubicle free or there's not a cubicle free. Um, and uh, Regardless, because we got to, we, the, our patient anyway, we may as well take them. So we take the patient off the crew. If there's a cubicle free, they get the cubicle handover. If there's no cubicle free, they will hand over onto a trolley and then we'll find a space for the patient afterwards. Rather than go, there isn't a space yet, we'll, we'll take the patient, they're ours, and then we'll find the space afterwards, which frees the crew up. Um, frees the crew up, they can go back out, they can go out that door, um, and then we'll find a space. Uh, the debate was on the, uh, the debate on the on the online on the WhatsApp group. Sorry, so we do put two in a cubicle because clearly we run out of space. We have got exit block, uh, and the way we do that, we can't do it for all our cubicles. We put them in the ones we do, and we put a screen down the middle. Um, but the, they come off the trolley. You take the hand over. Second thing is, um, we found the ratting doctor spent a lot of time not doing a lot of useful stuff. You no, know, it can't come in. The, so actually, and actually, how often does the ratting doctor truly? make a different to every patient probably not so every every nurse takes handover they then hand out they take the crew they take the patient they come and discuss it with the consult the, the senior streaming consultant or middle grade they discuss it with that person that person will go and see them if they need to go and see them if they don't need to go and see them they'll order anticoagulation head injury they just order the ct head and the nurse can order the bloods the nurse can do the ecgs the analgesia or whatever else or, or nebulizer or whatever is the doctor so 90 percent of that's predictable from a conversation rather than a um, it was a waste of time the doctor writing in the notes. The consultants are really, really busy. So rather than let the consultant write in the notes, the nurse writes in the notes. So they will write, discuss with bad Owens, plan, CT head, analgesia, IV fluids, whatever it is. Um, so me writing in 100 amounts a day, 100, 100 amounts of notes of streaming is a waste of time. Actually, so I don't do, we don't write the notes. They discuss it with me. They write down what we've done. So we've really tried to sort of lean the process down a lot. Um, and actually, we impact a lot of more patients because we can, one dot can stream them all as such um, and it's an educational opportunity to discuss it with the nurse well see I wouldn't do bloods on that one I would do bloods on that one um, and of course we, 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 we they can be streamed from there to the primary care service which is 24 hours to SDEC they can go to direct to a specialty so if a GP expects or are known by that specialty or they have a recent procedure by so special they can go straight to that specialty and the consultant or nurse can initiate that 
um, and by doing the sort of um, rat is a process not a place, you never run out of, there's never a bottleneck other than you physically run out of space. But as soon as you, as soon as you say, we'll take the patient, then find the cubicle afterwards, you eliminate the wait to look for a cubicle. The other thing we do is we will, we keep a close eye on the ambulance screen so we know what's coming. If there's three crews coming, we'll make the space before they get there. So we know they're coming, we'll try and make the space, we'll, we'll start thinking about doubling up, we'll start thinking about getting another trolley in. So we'll proactively look for the crews coming in. We've got a fit to, quite a proactive fit to sit area. We can have up to 20 people sat out. Um, so we'll either come straight off the trolley doing that or we'll take people on trolleys off trolleys to create capacity um, in terms of that. And the other thing we've done is we've managed the crews with EMAS. And what we do is, um, so the nurse, rather than the crew going off and putting the pin in, the nurse and the crew go together and put the pin in together. And that nails down the time. That's how you get really close to that sort of 15 minute average time is actually because the crew might go off, do some stuff, come back, then put the pin in. Occasionally they might go and get a drink or do something else or clean the ambulance. Because when you, when you pin it, when you until they pin, you're on the trust time. When they pinned in, it's on the crew's time. And we start to investigate. We start to investigate the long ones. We realised that it would have clearly been a handover. The, the notes, the patients in our department, and half an hour later, the pin went in and then the crew left with a one minute post handover time. So by controlling the handover time, the crew, you're giving the crew their time to get all free. And we've, so we had to, to get it that low. We had to perform, we had sort of manage it with EMAS. And we look at we look at the average times. The trust buys into it. So at every bed meeting, um, the first thing we talk about is what is the handover time? Either any issue, what do you need? So it's an organisational thing rather than an ED thing. Um, it can't be done by ED alone. It's got to be an organised. How are we going to how are we going to do it? And that's how we get submission. We don't do that. And essentially, that is the process. Um, so we've just it's a, it's a combination of managing the computer and the pin, getting rid of the ratting area, which causes a constraint. Um, trying to be lean by the consultant, not physically going and examining every patient, but actually and trying to be lean with the consultant's time by allocators the thing people might feel more uncomfortable about is our nursing ratios change at times clearly if you keep taking crews regardless the nursing ratio will change um and we go to in a cubicle and that's the debate the twisted debate i put out was about where would you rather be and as you expect 99 percent of people said they'd rather be in an ed either in a corridor or two to a cubicle and wait for ambulance in the community and that's a that's a rubbish place to be we shouldn't be there that's not the right thing to do as a system but it's still for me and the, the team it's less it's a lesser evil to do than what we are doing fully accepting it compromises the crowding in the ed uh, and, that, and essentially that's the process so we've tried to just be and we are we do a lot of fit to sit. We send a lot of people out and we send a lot of people direct straight to West Lake after the handover. We send a lot of people for primary care of ambulances. We do a lot of things like that. So we, we're consciously trying to manage our space as such. I'll stop there. Ben, thank you. Um, just while we let colleagues have a think about questions, which I'm sure they will want to ask you. I've written three things. I've written joint ownership, which is both in the department and with your ambulance kind of teams, but also across the trust. I've written form versus function, and that's about, I guess, process versus kind of physical space, but also the management of risk. And, and out of the three, and you and I have had the opportunity to talk about this before today, I think there's a mental leap that people need to make to move from a physical space to, to a process that basically stretches to the extent and the width of the department. In practical terms, if you had to think about three things that you did differently to make that happen, what what where would they be? Uh, in terms of, in terms of the, the actual practical procedural part of it, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I think getting rid of the ratting area uh, was that, uh, and the other advantage we found, sorry, about getting rid of the ratting area was actually that the nurse who takes the handover then keeps the patient. And in doing that, what we found was that your, your knowledge of the patient, your knowledge of the thing was much better. But the other thing we advantage we found to get rid of the ratting area was that the junior doctors, the, if, if there is no way to be seen, the juniors will go, we actually say to juniors, go and listen to the handover because they're in the same space, they're in the same environment. And so I'd say, I'd say for us, it was getting rid of the ratting area. It was making sure staff are flexible. So staff, what we have, we can't do is allocate this. Th these four cubicles are your this nurses. We allocate patients rather than places. So you you, you take patient like places. That's the second thing we had to do. Um, and um, rather than having a carer. 
uh, the carers, the, the blood taking ECG job sex aspect of it um, is allocated to carers on a job by job basis. And that allows us to go, right, those that they're the next three bloods, that one is an ECG, whatever else is yeah. done like that. So it's broken the team up a bit, but it's made the process a lot more efficient in doing so. So there's a trade off in this. You could argue that it's broken that small part of the team up, but yeah. actually created a much bigger team yeah. because I There's guess what you've described is the nurse moving with the patient until they physically yeah. left the department then. Yeah, and, and, and we don't do things like, yeah, so if, if a patient goes to x-ray and someone comes in, their cubicle's gone, but we'll fight, we'll, we'll, or when they come back, we'll work it out. But you start as, soon again. As, nurse, as soon as the nurse owns the patient, not the cubicle, it doesn't matter yeah. anymore. Yeah, no, that makes sense. We've got a question for you from Christina. Hi. Um, I'm Christina, so I'm a senior sister at Torbay in South Devon um, NHS Found, um, Foundation Trust. Um, so, as um, just speaking as a nurse advocate, um, what we struggle with is the elderly population where we are, and that for that that takes up our trolley space. Um, we have a lot of falls. Bit... Sorry, I've got a daughter in the background. <laughs> Um, but um, I'm just interested to know what your nurse to patient ratio is and our layout of ED is very difficult to navigate. So, uh, so our ED is, it's a slightly odd shape. It's not, it's not, it's not a perfect space at all. It is, it's, 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 it's certainly not, a, the line of sight's not great. Um, so our, so our nurse to patient ratio is hard to, we don't have a fixed one in rent majors. We don't have one as in the sense of uh, peak staffing we will have. So we, we are an ED that sees um the ed part on the primary care bit we'll see about 330 350 people patients a day and our, our peak staffing we have about 20 nurses on shift approximately give or take uh, but, but the, the nurse staffing is not a fixed sort of days nights thing it's staggered so we have a day and nights and there's some come on at nine some come on at 11 so we've tried to stagger we've staggered the nursing workload Sorry, no, I stagger the nurse staffing to meet the workload because we're clearly busier at 5 p.m. than we are at 5 a.m. And therefore, having said so, we've very much staggered some of those shifts. So we have days and nights, and then there's a, some nurses that come in the middle and do that. So the staffing profile is that to the middle of the day to match the occupancy of, of the department and the triage workload um, as part of that. Thank you. Um... So what we've got at the moment is our patients are in the department for up to three days. And so I know it's not great. And um, and so those pay, uh, you can't move then um, those those flexibility. So you're constantly always full in majors and there is no leeway until you get beds moved. So what we're kind of asking if we were to follow your process would be to rat, which we call RAS, a so rapid assessment area as such, and we do have a fixed um, cubicle for that. But if we were to change that, we're asking our nursing staff to do blood CCGs, um, do their triage, then to, we've got we have to move our patients out of the out of the department when they do get a bed, also deliver personal care. Um, and now we're doing medication rounds um, like a ward. So it's a huge task, which we're already struggling with that workload. Um, and to add that on, I don't know how that would work. No, thank you. I, it's hard, isn't it? And I think so. We've looked at there's the same amount of work to do and the same amount of staff on shifts. There's the same number of bloods to take and really do it. It, it. it does change that thing. And, and what we do is we tend to try and we try to put, if we're not as full, we sometimes are, we will put the bed waiters together because they've been swapped. They've come in, and anyone, anyone with whatever symptoms, anyone with sort of um, to temperature, it gets swabbed, anyone arrivals to swab, COVID swab and or a flu swab, really. But the, the, all the emissions are then swabbed. So we know, so they're the ones we try to cohort first. So actually, it was two to a cubicle, it's two admission patients to a cubicle. Uh, because they're, they're, they're being seen, they're being treated, they are things, so they then go to a cubicle if we have to. Um, uh, and therefore, um, you kind of cohort in the admitted patients into certain cubicles, so we know that, from that point of view and it's the same look, flip it around there's the same amount same number of nurses and the same number of jobs the same kind com of comfort to do it's just doing it in a you, you're chopping the work up in a different way um is the way out we've looked at it it's simply that the work's got to get done no matter where they do it who does it or whatever else it's still the same number of staff and the same amount of work to be done and and, and the main trade-off for the staff we've talked about is if we have ambulance delays, which we've always tried to avoid doing, you don't get fewer patients. You just get those patients later in the day when they're more different. And actually, for the nursing staff, is do I want to take them now at 
11 in the daytime or 5 in the evening, I'll have them now then, because they're going to come at some point, they may as well be here now, I would rather have a, a really rubbish, difficult day shift than an even harder night shift, because if, if they don't see in the daytime, you get space to the night time, so it's, a, it is, it's all a trade-off, and that trade-off is we'd rather have a difficult day shift, when there's more hospital around as a such, because of the, the, the nights, and that's our trade off and that is, is that those patients that care and comfort all got to be done still it's just been done um in, uh, in, in, in a different way i'm not saying the model is perfect but it's quite effective thank you but and i would say it's partly a trade off but also partly probably organizational differences in how we choose to manage that conversation around risk isn't it yeah. because th those constraints i guess are going to manifest themselves in slightly different ways um I'm conscious that we're coming up to half past and we want to kind of hand over to Laura soon, but are there any other questions for Ben from colleagues before we hand over to Laura? In the absence of any hands, I will assume that people are still I reflecting. Of point, course which I think, you can. Which I think yes, is relevant. You, you've, got, you've got six minutes, Ben. No, no, it's, I'll, I'll finish first. it's relevant because one thing we do have that not every department will have is that um, the medical and surgical teams we have a very fast response from them. So they will come and see the patients in the department in real time. If anyone referred on the medical take, the day take is eight till four, the late take is four to late, and then there's a night take. The day team do not leave till everyone is seen regardless of where they are and the light, later do. So I know from an ED point of view, they will be seen by a medic, they will get a BT stuff done, they will get the drug chart written, they will get all that stuff done, and that does not fall on the ED medical team. And with exit block and beds, we have increased our nursing numbers to try and help us deal with that nursing workload. And most of our blood, CCGs, everything, our carers, band threes do all those. The nurses aren't doing many, very few bloods, very few things. They're all done by carers. We're back to that doing to ownership conversation that we talked about before. But I guess, and it, you know, it also talks to the internal professional standards. And, and we've got a little bit of time. Rob, I wonder if there's an opportunity to bring you in. I know we've talked about the best practice visits and we will share a document. There is a summary document that might be useful to colleagues, which kind of compiles the kind of top things that those organisations had been identified as perhaps doing a little bit differently. But from your perspective, Rob, is there anything in, in that vein that we need to kind of share a little bit more on? I, it's it's so difficult to encapsulate it all in a couple of uh, a couple of moments. You know, we I think we all agree on this call that the uh, Ambulance handover delays are a symptom system, if you like. And some of what Ben talks about is the the philosophy and culture that he has been, a, been able to engender locally. And it probably doesn't, he's probably a little bit modest in terms of how he maintains and leads that and keeps that in the forefront of people's minds day in, day out. And it doesn't happen by magic and it doesn't stay there and exist and endure without the constant attention that Ben his team, wider partners are able to apply uh, to this thing, to this thing, which is ambulance handover delays, but it's it's patient risk, weights and harm, isn't it, when you really boil it down? So so I think that philosophy culture is the thing that probably stitches together maybe the 16 best practice visits. They'll have components of what Ben is talking about, but there's very few places which seem to do it all to a high high degree there's there's always there's always a um a, a moment of learning in a, in a site or a system and there's always some really good examples even in some systems which may be in some circles con considered less well performing so so is a so it's a case of distilling some some of that i'll put the link into the um the summary document the learning from the um the performing ambulance handover visits um for people to come and visit on the on the on the page but what i'm really interested in doing is is if you think you you've got something that's a little bit a little bit akin to one of these areas but not quite we're interested to hear about that and we're interested to start to share that and pick up like like we've done Sherwood and other places to to bring that into the line of sight of other people that are going through this. And, and some of the comments are, are very broad, I know, um, but those small little examples of oh, we we don't quite do that, but we could we could do that. And that's the thing that we're keen to um, enable uh, through through our work. So I'll put the link in, um, but philosophy. Um, and the leadership that's associated with that philosophy and culture is really, really key. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, Laura, but just before we hand over to you, there's um, Ali with her hand up. So, hi, Ali. 
All right, thank you. Sorry. Ben, I just had a quick question. What percentage of your major's patients are clerked, seen and awaiting a bed? So we're just blocking the beds in your department. So, hi, Ali, nice to see you. Hi. Um, so I think so it varies. So we've we've been fairly lucky in terms of patient flow. It's been compared to lots of places. We've had a certainly had a difficult uh, thing. Well, I think on um, well, a particularly horrible day last Tuesday, which is the worst day I think I've ever worked. Um, but yeah, I would say we, we have averaged probably between in the last. Three months we've averaged which a range of between up to 30 bed waiters and down to one or two usually a 30 on a monday down to sort of one or two on a uh, sort of friday saturday period uh, over the last three months prior to the last three months we've been probably 10 down to none across the course of the week but the, the last three months has been yeah 30 down to 10 but with the ambulance hand over time uh, it's stayed pretty much the same okay. but yeah we have it's, it's got harder and harder yeah thank you Ben, I'm assuming that requires an element of full capacity from the organisation's point of view to sustain. Am I wrong? To a degree, with the, with the, the, the trust, so they, they, they don't do boarding on the wards on the, okay. the trust. They, they don't do that. That's, it's, it's driven by urgent care and that sort of thing. And we do, they do go one over against a discharge, but they don't go okay. one over. Not extra. Actually, yeah. That's great. Laura, I will hand over to you now. Thanks for waiting patiently. That's OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I've got a presentation to share. Um, it wasn't made for this meeting, so just bear with me for the bits that are not completely relevant. Um, but our process is kind of the opposite of what Ben was saying in terms of the rapid assessment. Um, and going back to what uh, Christina was saying about the constraints in terms of flow and bed weights. So we're seeing these pressures every day in the department. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were always OK at ambulance turnaround, so we had a good baseline, is what I would say. Um, and then the, when the pandemic hit, we had to change the layout of our department. Um, it meant we, we had constraints in terms of rapid assessment and ambulance turnaround. Um, so we had to think differently and do something different. So we actually created a new rapid assessment area, which was a bit further away from the main body of the department. Um, I know some of the people, some of the guys on the call have, have been to visit us at Salford. Um, and that's a six bedded area. So it's got three trolleys and three chairs. So we very much promote fit to sit through there. Um, it's quite close to the ambulance car park. One of the things that we've done in terms of um, the process so the process has been key for the nursing team so it's been very much around the hearts and minds of the team what people believe in what do we as an organization and as a department want to do to really promote ambulance turnaround and where does that risk sit comfortably with people um also in line with what ben was saying it's around um the the ownership so when do they when do the patients become our responsibility so really sharing that information one of the things that we've done exceptionally well is work with mwas which is a northwest ambulance service so we're very uh, very close collaboration with them and we've got really good working relationships with the with the operational team from mwas so that's really helped um, we've built a process whereby the patients are triaged at the bedside. So I'm a senior instructor for Manchester Triage as a, as a side job. Um, and we've got a, a really robust triage process. So we triage at the bedside. Um, we've removed all has screens out of the rapid assessment area. So it's very much that the nurse goes up to the bedside. They triage the patient um, at the bedside and then the two of them pin the patient out directly, pin the ambulance out as soon as that handover is complete. In terms of flow, we've got a porter assigned to the area. So as soon as the patient's um, been triaged, the support workers will do their blood ECGs, the workup. If we've got clinical in reach into rapid, um, at that point, the consultant might front load some investigations. Um, and then as soon as uh, they're ready, they move down to the department. So it doesn't matter whether the department's busy or the department's not busy. It's as soon as the patient is ready, we need to be moving that patient on to make space for the next patient to come in. So um, the portal will then take the patient down into the main body of the department. The handover is done. If there's any clinical concern, it'll be um, over the phone um, or they will have a full triage document by that point. So and, and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So it sounds really simple because then you get into the main body of the department. We've got like everywhere else, we've got corridor care. We've got cubicles that are full. 
um, to capacity. We might have, you know, 30 patients waiting beds, um, etc. So we meet the same demands as the other departments. We're a major trauma centre. We see a high number of patients every day. We receive between 70 and 90 ambulances a day on average. Um, one thing we don't do is take our standby ambulances through rapid assessment. So the pre-alerts go straight to resource and resource manage the pre-alert capacity. All of the routine ambulances go through rapid assessment. Um, obviously, that's not always perfect because, as you'll know, you'll get a standby and then that patient's not as sick as you anticipated or vice versa. They're not on a standby and they're more sick than you anticipated. So um, what we do then is work well as a team just to, you know, ring through to the other area. We send the patient where they need to be so the patient's getting the best care as early as possible. Um, I'll just share my presentation quickly. doesn't want now want to share which is a bit frustrating sorry about that just bear with me a second Nora we could see your screen I just couldn't see the presentation but your screen shared all right try it again yeah that works perfectly is that okay yeah I can see the screen yeah OK, so this is um, just a, it's a PowerPoint that I've shared previously um, with the team. So this is pre uh, this went back to pre pandemic. So 2018. Um, so you can see there that we weren't far off where we needed to be, but there were times when we were our performance wasn't as as good as it should have been. So we were um, around 20 minutes on average. I think when we worked it out, the mean average over a, a period, it was about between 19 and 21 minutes from arrival to handover, um, which wasn't meeting national standard. But it, again, it wasn't the worst um, in terms of GM or nationally. So we had a fairly OK baseline to start with. Um, and then as we moved into the pandemic, you can see the spike there in 21. Um, our ambulance turnaround times were um, in at the time was, was increasing um, and we were really in a position where we weren't happy with the performance or the um, the experience of the patients and the team. The nursing team felt the pressure at this point. Um, so what we wanted to do was uh, obviously reduce our ambulance triage time down to under 15 minutes with a total turnaround time within 30 as the national um, target. Um, improve the initial see and treat process, so improve that communication between the nursing and the support worker team and the nursing and the clinical team again, um, and really do what we did quite well before, again, really. Um, early identification and allocation of patients at high risk, so we didn't want patients to be queuing outside, we didn't want patients to be on corridors that had not been triaged. Um, we really wanted to know what our workload was, and we really wanted to prioritise the right patients um, for the right treatment as soon as possible. So how we did it, so we relocated, like I've said, to the rapid assessment area. Um, we had three trolley bays and three chairs. We really pushed fit to sit through those chairs as well. Um, we excluded the pre-alerts because we felt the distance was just a bit too far away um, for the pre-alerts to be going the long way around, really. Um, we introduced a point of care testing, which is now moved somewhere else. So it really helped to identify risk in terms of infection um, so we could place patients effectively, which was a big winner uh, during the pandemic. Um, and then reviewed the location of the house screen. So what we asked for them in a business case was the things that I've just said we needed to make some simple adjustments to the car park and things like that. But we've done that now and that's all in embedded. Uh, so the advantages um, is the increased number of spaces to accept patients. Um, having that designated transfer porter, um, we call them flow assistants, um, but they really help like kind of make trolleys in between patients, etc. and just speed up that process. Earlier identif uh, identification of risk was a big winner. Um, and then the estate to enable that two door model. So the other advantage is if anyone that <laughs> who's been to Salford, you'll know we've got quite a lot of corridors. So we've got um, We've got we have got capacity to allow patients to offload. Um, one of the things that comes with that, the caveat is it needs to be staffed. Um, and the disadvantages is the distance away from the area. And I've also put corridor care on the disadvantage as well, because it's a it can be a win lose, can't it, if you're not adequately staffed and the patients are not cared for. So we need to make sure that that's happening all the time. Um, in terms of the process, and I'm happy to share the slide if anyone wants to look at the process in a bit more detail. But as I said, they offload onto an empty trolley. Um, 
a bedside handover takes place and then that house screen is completed straight away. Um, there's no coffee runs, no cleaning trolleys, no stretcher cleaning, anything like that on the time it's all done on and west time um their cleaning equipment is all outside of the rapid assessment so they have to go back outside to clean the trolley so therefore they pin off before that um they have their initial investigations like i've said and then they move through the department so the big things for us was about sharing the goal reducing lost hours enabling MWAS to respond to the category one and two emergencies educating the team about the bigger picture so the same message will be portrayed throughout the team you'll never get 100 percent with that like there'll always be people that have a different opinion and that's absolutely fine um but the majority uh, feel the same way it, it we have to share the risk so we don't want if it was our family at home we would want an ambulance to come if we called one and that's very much the message that we give so also if you've got ambulances queuing up outside then those patients are not receiving the treatment that, re that, re that they require so they're more likely to deteriorate requiring more care and a, a longer hospital stay in the end so it's much more productive to get your patients into the department as soon as possible that initial assessment and treatment started as soon as possible um, recognizing the good practice in the team so sharing the good practice with the team celebrating um, when people had had a really good day you know it got a bit competitive at one point about who had the best ambulance turnaround time making it as fun and as upbeat as you can um but then it, you get into a lull where it's kind of oh it's old news now we've been doing this a while things slip off again so you have to gen you have to really drive the change and you have to continually drive the change so there's not a day where i don't have the ambulance turnaround screen you know the ambulance has screen up on my computer and intermittently checking you know what's going on the house screens are still dotted around the department for recent majors the nurse in charge will have it up on their computer as well so it's very much keeping our eye on the ball you don't want to take your eye off the ball um now don't, don't get me wrong it's not a perfect model and when the department is under the pressure all of our eds has been under recently um our ambulance time is affected it's affected like everybody else's um but overall we're still managing to maintain so this was um, implementation of rapid assessment in 2022. So it was implemented in January. And you can see there that the um, arrival to handover reduced to 15 minutes um, or below. And the turnaround time was sitting under 30 minutes um, all the way from January to June. We had um, a few months in the summer which were um, more difficult. So as you can see here, so July and August, uh, August, September, sorry, went up to 31 minutes. And then the same in December, 31 minutes. But overall, it's still averaging at around 30 minutes turnaround time. Um, and the number in the middle column is how many ambulances we receive a month. Uh, nationally, so this is old data, but I couldn't get the, the updated data in time. Um, so this is the national picture. So the top slide is 30 to 60 minutes between June 21 and 22, and then um, 30 to 60 turnaround on the bottom slide. And that is it, really, from a presentation point of view. <coughs> um, and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Laura. Although, as you said, your process may be a little bit different to the one at Sherwood Forest, I think the common thread running between the two presentations is that focus on the patient and what if that patient was me, what if that patient was my relative, which, which I think particularly now is probably very, very important, but equally very, very poignant. Any questions from anybody on the call for Laura? Getting off lightly. Well, <laughs> we let people. Uh, I'll, I, I've got a question, Laura, because I think it's important, and and I guess both you and Ben made this point. It's just about keeping that message going and and kind of revisiting it. So, in the context and in the midst of the pressures we are dealing with right now, how have you done that? Because it, you know, it it's hard. It's hard enough to keep everybody's spirits up, but to keep those messages kind of live and and kind of at the forefront of people's minds can't be easy. So what would your top tip be in that respect? So I think it needs to be a collaboration. So you very much need the support of your MWAS colleagues or your ambulance colleagues. Um, you you know, you, you definitely need that. Um, I think just the communication on a day to day basis and having the oversight. So it's not always easy and you don't it's not always a fun filled conversation you know it's sometimes it's it can be challenging um but as a team they the team have been amazing we've they've been really embracing of the changes made some concerns initially and i think you have to be able to talk through your concerns you have to be able to share the good practice um and 
you know there hasn't been adverse incidents to the point where you would need so it's it's about good governance so you have to have a good governance structure you have to really be able to um communicate with the team about what needs to happen um and really just trying to share the the good practice so plus it's been celebrated a lot so it's been yeah, celebrated which is a lot so important, by us isn't it? about the from the organization you know the fact that we've had best practice visits and all that kind of stuff it's it's all good news isn't yeah. it so um that really helps to um promote people's confidence in the system fantastic there's a question for you from rob in the chat and i'm sure the answer is yes but we'll ask you anyway um are you happy if um, people contact you just to kind of discuss your approach in a little bit more detail. It will probably be through ESIS. Rob, is that right? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's right. Um, brilliant. Super. Thank you. Ben, Thanks. your hand is up. Thank you. Adam, really interesting to hear what, you, what you've done, Laura. I, I, I'm just trying to think. I, 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 I think there's often a lot of this stuff is around principles behind aging care rather than the actual process. and. Forgetting that you, for a second, of what you described, you have a very a, a rat process, a sort of raw process, as you call it. Um, but I think there's a lot of similarities in the sense that the collaborative work with the ambulance service, I think, is is crucial. You can't do it without them, and the all the sort of management thing. You go, you can clean, you can clean, you clean your trolley outside, and with with pinned in, you're gone. It's like that. that sounds the same. The mindset thing, the my relative thing, the um, sounds like you have said like we do is they will. We will deliberately deliver, deliberately crowd the department to offload the ambulance, which it sounds like you're doing as well at time in a, a different way. We go to the cubicle rather than the corridor. Our corridors are not that we haven't got many really, or um and the celebrate thing is really important, I think, as well. We we we, we certainly chat, we we have a sort of there's a bit of a competition between the nurses in charge. They go who's had the best time this week and who's had this and who's had the I think that's really important to to celebrate. So thank you as well. Uh, but so a different process in the handing over bit but I, what you're describing to me it sounds like all the other principles behind it are very similar is that fair to say yeah i i do think so i think and the one thing is about rapid when you said it at the start we refer to it as rapid apologies is um it's it's very flexible so you could move that model you could move it to a completely different space it's not the space and that's what I try to say to people because they always it's okay because you've got a space no we had we have a space but that's because there was a space that was being um you know it wasn't being used at the time but actually the model is the key so the space is good but the model and the principles are, are what make it work because if you don't have the model you don't have the principles you've not got the team pulling in the right direction then it doesn't matter how much space you've got, you will never achieve those targets because it's a really tough target, isn't it? That's the main, you know, the big thing. It's it's really hard to do. So yeah. Especially now. Ben, is that a new question? No, Comment. No, sorry. Okay. Um I, I guess there's a lot of heart involved here, isn't there? And I don't think, you know, you you've both said a lot in, in that respect. But the one thing I can't get away from, which you've both talked about, is is the importance of that collaboration with the ambulance teams that are working in your organization. And to narrow that gap or the time it takes from the patient being offloaded to the time it takes to then pin that process off or to kind of complete that cycle. Uh, Rob, at the risk of putting you on the spot again, but we have talked before the session, I know um, mm -hmm. there's some good practice that you think we can share in that respect, because I think that's a, that's a very practical step that people can hopefully look to take that doesn't involve capital investment, that doesn't involve massive changes to the layout of their department. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's often a reflection, the the discipline shall we call it that around around that is often a reflection of the culture the attitudes the engagements and all the other things that the guys have been des describing so some of the places that have seen it work well um are places like um this is going back a little bit people on the call might be able to underline some some of this southampton uhs southampton um but of course that took a a concerted effort not just from the ambulance service but the nursing colleagues as as well it was a, a real you know we we all own we all own this direction of direction of travel and if we go back a few years to when there was fines associated with with the, the handover delays and all sorts of other things it, it wasn't necessarily breeding the right collaborative um approach so um when the language is around weights and harm 
and ambulance response times and um, patients waiting in the department, you get a different type of engagement. And, uh, and I think that's the thing that really shines uh, through from not just these presentations here, but of the different 16 best practice pieces um, that shines through in those those environments there. So UHS for, for one, um, there's other places across the country for sure that have good technological approaches to that, but it always needs a human to interact with that technological approach. So uh, um, I think the, the human hearts and minds, it seems ever so fluffy in this world of ours sometimes, but it's absolutely fluffily essential um, to get things across the, across the line. So uh, um, I think um, I think the the piece around um, process often relates more to people than the process. But sometimes we have people working in, in really tricky processes. And that's some of the work that we do around value stream mapping and the likes that can really help people understand that and work, work a little bit more tightly in the process to help them refine um, what it feels like for the people working in it. So uh, um, there's no easy answer to that. But it needs all of the things that uh, both Laura and Ben described in the um, in the earlier comments. So uh, I know it's not helpful, but I'll link people through to the best practice sites if they link in to, to myself. Thanks, Rob. That is really helpful. And actually also something having done a, um, a small podcast with colleagues at Madura, which is something that they reinforced as part of their value stream mapping exercise. They were really surprised by some of the things they found out by actually just sitting and observing that process, because I think sometimes we take for granted that the process works in the way we think it does. But they, you know, they found out little things that actually making those little tweaks across the pathway, providing a screen in one place in the department rather than somewhere else actually made such a cumulative difference that it, you know, it, it actually helped ultimately reduce that kind of waiting time for the patient. We're Having up to 10 minutes to, and you've been a relatively quiet audience, so I don't want to miss the chance for people to ask any more questions. Any more questions for either Ben or Laura before we draw the session to a close? Ali? Hi, yeah. I'm just thinking about, um, you said deliberately crowding the department. So the care standards then of the patients in the department, do you feel they dropped? Because if you're stretching your nursing ratio that far, then surely your care and your onward care suffers. And was there any morbidity and mortality associated with that? So, um, so, the, the, so two things. Yeah, absolutely. If you crowd your department, the quality of the care you give in terms of privacy and dignity or certainly proximity uh, 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 and um, the uh, sort of noise, volume, whatever else, clearly, clearly is compromised. There's no question that it's compromised. But actually, as a trade-off versus you're in the community and you need an ambulance and no one comes. Uh, and there was a really powerful thing someone had put on um someone 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 had put on Twitter and they, they it was it was someone and they said it was a parent of a person who'd um their son had died at home in his twenties had died at home waiting for an ambulance waiting for a long time had to, I forget what he had was wrong with this uh, and she said she, her comment was I'd have I'd give anything now to have my son sat in an unlit cold barely staffed corridor in an ED compared to being at home waiting for an ambulance because if he had a cardiac arrest in the ED he may well have survived and he did not and that's a really emotive horrible thing so, so, so it, it is a deliberate choice this is a balancing of risks thing so it, I, I know if my it was myself my relative I'd much rather be in an ED in a noisy environment and that's why that Twitter poll that I did which was 98 percent of people said they would rather be in an ED in a corridor in a to the cubicle or in a corridor than being the community we know ambulance. So yes, we are deliberately choosing to compromise the care in ED, but there are huge benefits as well. So by taking all your ambulance patients when they arrive versus when when the space, what we're actually doing is we're giving we're giving them access to the treatment of the doctor. So if I'm an A&E doctor on nights and, and eight percent of our ambulances arrive before the night team starts. If there's a three hour ambulance delay, I'm actually, I don't have an analysis of this, I'm actually putting uh, rather than 20, 25% of ambulances on the night team, I'm putting 40% of ambulances on the night team. So, which, so from a staff point of view, it's better to have a crowded, busy day on an okay night than a really busy night. So it's, it's a trade off, it's not perfect. But yes, we are deliberately crowding and deliberately compromising some of the privacy comp proximity stuff on purpose. But that gives you a safer patient experience overall 
and a better staff experience at night when most people are the most tired, most fed up, most things. So it's a trade off. It's not perfect by long stretch. Thanks. We actually work our, um, we have a staffing ratio, so an, an acuity score tool, which is newly introduced. Um, so we staff our corridors this, to the same ratios as we staff the majors cubicles. So they, they are staffed. It's not a pop them on the corridor and leave them to it kind of experience. They are nursing staffed corridors um, and we try to do reverse corridor care. So it's patients who are waiting, um, who are stable and well enough to wait. It's not patients who are deteriorating acutely unwell and unable to get into a cubicle. So it's very much about how you prioritise your acuity and your workload across the whole of the department to facilitate offload as well as caring for the acutely unwell patients. And as I said in the chat, and I think it's probably important to reinforce, we are in an environment here where we're talking about least worst options. It's it's not the ideal, and I, you know, absolutely everybody would reinforce and accept that if if you know the circumstances were different, we would be doing different things. Uh, but I guess that in the context of then organisational decisions, which are likely to vary, it's fair to say, from one place to another around the management of risk, is what determines perhaps where that balance is best sat. And it's also probably fair to say, Ben, isn't it, that that decision might not be the same from one day to the next, because yeah, the risk it, might be different as well. Yeah, it depends what I think. It depends what Marnes is like. We 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 probably push the risk boundaries internally as such. So yeah, we we will send chest pains to Estec on an ECG and pain free. We don't wait for a trop or anything like that. We've been doing it for ten years. We've not had an issue yet with it. So. so, so we will certainly push the boundaries of spreading that risk through the, through the system rather than, rather than um, so some places won't address it without a chop back or whatever else. But the triage nurse can do it for minors, they can, can do it off the ambulance trolley. So we will spread that patient load through the system in that sense as well. Emily, your hand is up. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to um, go on the back off this risk sharing um, conversation and that I do feel that absolutely what you've been saying, Ben, about your organisation and deciding to take this risk on itself, because the problem is with A&E departments and um, ambulance services, it's a passive risk. You don't actually have to make a decision for the risk to accumulate in those areas. You don't, whereas to take that extra patient on a ward or to take that riskier discharge, you have to know the risk and then accept it, which is why we need to change the culture of risk and risk management in our organisations, um, because everybody just, we essentially have redundant deliberation where we don't do something because actually the thought of doing something we know what the risk is and they don't want to take responsibility of that I say they as in inverted commas but it's it's a general way we know we work. It yeah exactly um and I think that we have to uh, you really encourage our leaders to take on that responsibility and say yeah we are going to take that risk and we know that taking Betty with a drop of um you know 300 is a bit of a risk to go and border on a corridor but actually we've decided that that's better than um us you know having the, that ultimate risk which is in the community because nothing scares me more I'm an A&E nurse by background having a patient I can't see because to, to tell you now I, I remember the times when we didn't we didn't queue ambulances you just accepted whoever came in and there was tens of patients in front of you at least I could see all their faces and if one of them went off I would know about it um, but I do think it's it's looking beyond that because it sounds like a, I missed the start of the presentations but it's all surrounded by A&E again and urgent care services actually we need to push this beyond that and everywhere needs to take on a little bit extra feel a little bit uncomfortable because it, just because they, they no one has to act for this risk to happen um, we need to kind of you know be active in this and actively accept risk does that make sense very valid point emily ben shall we let you do the final point I, and I, close I, I as think, well i think the risk thing is really important and then Christine's put something in the chat and I think it, 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 we probably do take more risk in ED than some parts of the organisation. We've got a fairly responsive trust and a really supportive trust, um, but I see it differently. It's not the ED's risk, it's the patient's risk. And if you make the mental leap, that the risk belongs to the patient, not the staff or the hospital, because we do have a supportive trust and the trust accepts that if the ED is crowded and we and care is compromised, as things go wrong, it is um, not necessarily the fault of that staff who back it the organization takes the 
But actually, the risk, as soon as you accept the risk sits with the patient, not with the staff in the hospital, in, or 90% of the risk sits with the patient, and that's then actually the worst thing for the patient is being in the community with the ambulance. Being in the ED in a crowded environment is better than that. And therefore, we're reducing the patient's risk by doing what we're doing. Um, and the risk is theirs, not ours. And if the trust supports it with its policies, then as a clinician, you're not going to lose your pin or your job because you're doing what the trust has agreed is the most appropriate thing in the thing. It's a hard leap for staff to make, but if you get in your head that risk is varied, risk has to be balanced, there's, no, there's a trade off at least for its options, but the organisation will support you, then actually the risk is the patient's not yours. If the risk is the patient, what's the least risky thing for the patient versus what's the least risky thing for the system or staff? That's that's the mental leap. To try to get to you oh, actually then you then you it's easier to change your policies and flex your process to reduce the risk for the patient overall and that's that's my thought on risk and anyways thanks ben that's probably the best note we could think of i think to end today's session um in the absence of any further questions and reflections given that it's nearly five o'clock i'll say thank you to all of you for having given up this hour i hope that you found the conversation helpful and at least um, an opportunity i guess to get some headspace and to think about what you might be able to do differently within your respective organizations we will share um the best practice report that rob has just kind of put in the chat along with some podcasts and the recording of the session on um, our YouTube and I'll also post links on the WhatsApp group as well. Um, I'll put a post on the WhatsApp probably in the next week or so just to gauge interest for any further sessions because like I said if there is any interest we will definitely be happy to coordinate them. Thank you very much everyone for joining and have a good evening. Thanks,